Hello! Today I went to Burton with the ducking historians to talk to our friends at Burton Mind. So, let's see how that went. Obviously to protect the privacy of any people using mind service because mental health is a very sensitive topic so you you don't want your personal business being put on YouTube of course so I didn't film outside of the interview room so I just took a few photos of the facilities you know the things that were going on you know, just a few like the posters as you'll see here in the pictures as well as the meditation garden and a little garden by uh, a group known as Muddy Boots who are an initiative that help do gardening that help use gardening to do mental health work. <clears throat> Thank you for being on the program. For the viewers at home, would you mind introducing yourself and your role at Burton Mind? Hi, my name's Kerry Lawrence and I'm here as the Development and Sustainability Officer at Burton and District Mind. Thank you. Um, what would you say are the main challenges facing mental health work? Um, we're in Mental health is always in an ever-changing state in terms of mental health services and mental health charities. Um, due to the pandemic, um, the cost of living crisis, we've certainly seen a, a huge rise in the number of people wanting to make use of our services. Um, and this, is, this might be a mix of people that have needed to use mental health services before, but we're also seeing an increase in, in people that uh, we wouldn't have seen before uh, and this is made due to many reasons really so for instance during the pandemic um, we had people um, who perhaps were on furlough now having that time to process things like childhood trauma um, the cost of living crisis has brought an enormous amount of social inclusion issues as people are struggling to to feed themselves, um, heat their houses, and we've had instances where people have, have had to give up pets because they can no longer afford to keep a pet. And you think about pets being some people's utter lifeline, particularly if they're socially isolated, and that's, that's really sad. And um, how would you say MIND tackles these issues? In terms of MIND, MIND is uh, the biggest mental health charity um, in England and Wales. Um, although MIND itself is um, built up of over a hundred separate organisations who come together under one federation. Uh, this means that we've got the best of both worlds. Uh, people recognise us very easily as being the biggest charity, but also a lot of our decision making, um, a lot of the way that we, we want to work and the communities that we interact with are local communities, they're local to us. So Burton and District MIND we're based here in Burton, we're not based in London or in the North East or something. We're here based in Staffordshire. Oh, I might just follow on from one of the other, slightly out of order, but still. Um, I noticed this is mined for Burton and District. Does this mean that uh, branches of mind focus on mental health of their locality? Yeah, typically they will do. Here at Burton District Mind, we cover three. Um, local authority districts. So we're here covering East Staffordshire, we cover Tamworth, uh, Tamworth Borough and Litchfield District. Um, in the rest of Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Strent is served by North Staff's Mind. And then over the border just into Derbyshire we've got Derbyshire Mind as well. So that just gives you a flavour of some of those local minds. But as I say each of us are different organisations, uh, achieving funding in different ways and have our own specialisms. So here at Burton and District Mind, uh, for a long time our, um, our specialism was counselling, adult counselling. North Staff's Minds, their specialism has been young persons counselling, but they provide adult counselling as well. Over in Derbyshire, Derbyshire Minds specialism has been advocacy work. That doesn't mean we're all limited to those services though and as um, you know, people's needs have become greater we've had to scratch our heads and come up with better ways in discussion with our communities around how to best serve them. Here at Burton and District Mind this means that we started putting on mindfulness groups, ecotherapy, walk and talk football and peer support groups 
to make sure that we could cover the entire spectrum of mental health problems. Ah. So um, when, when it comes to this sort of, uh, these sort of divide, the sort of like each individual district, how do you feel this, these affect the service that MIND provides? I think the first thing is, is it means there is a breadth of expertise across the MIND Federation. Um, because we've all got our own specialisms, we know who to phone if something crops up. So if something, for instance, legal crops up, someone phones us and they have a, 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 a legal issue with regards to mental health, because there are some mental health acts, um, we know who to turn to. We can phone Derbyshire Mind and, and ask them for their help. And in return, they'll do the similar when it, when it comes to counselling services. So it, having that network is really helpful to us. It means that we can find the experts very quickly. As well, National Mind support with all sorts of things as well, like bid development and service development, um, and provide um, you know, all of our branding and marketing, which is really important in, in giving us that positive message. Speaking of uh, all these roles and stuff, what kind of jobs are needed to allow mine to operate? Uh, okay, um, there's a lot. There's a lot, particularly now. Um, I think when I first started here nearly three years ago, um, there was only three or four different roles within the organisation, and now, now there's a lot. Um, Typically, someone might come to us as a volunteer and do some volunteering as um, a community help associate or a peer group facilitator. They're building those skills, perhaps they have lived experience themselves and they're putting that experience to good use. Selling what might have been quite a difficult part of their life but turning that into something positive. From that, and this, this has happened, um, some of those uh, community help associates go on to become recovery workers for us and that will be working either in some of our distress services or with our future focus service. And that will be, you know, providing that one-to-one -one support um, to individuals where needed uh, to help them sort of manage their own mental health. And we can do that in lots of different ways. Um, other roles might be our counselling roles. And all of our counsellors are, are graduated, registered counsellors. Um, uh, that, that have to go through all of that stuff to make sure that they can demonstrate that they are experts at counselling. Um, we don't currently have any student counsellors here uh, because we want to make sure that everybody who comes for that protected service gets the best possible service that they can. Um, but there's also, you know, we need a back office function. We need managers. Um, we need um, finance officers, we need administrators, and those those people, you know, it's when people donate to charities. I don't think they all they always want that money to be going to deliver directly uh, to people who use services, and, and rightly so, rightly so. But there is an aspect of well, who is going to fund that management and that that finance officer function? So you know, some of our fundraising does go to do that, but it means that we can keep a really effective service running. Oh, and uh, speaking of like all these different roles, you don't mind me asking, do you need to be a graduate to work at MIND? No, not at all, not at all. I think it all depends on the role. I think it all depends on the role. I think for many of our recovery jobs, we are looking for people who have got GCSEs in maths and English. Uh, we would be looking for someone that can use computers as well because it's, it just makes the jobs more effective but really other than a level two mental health qualification which we can help uh, supply and provide um, no i don't think a graduate level is required but for some jobs it would be but that'd be very clear in the specification oh, all right thanks oh, thank, thank you very much and oh do you mind if i ask about funding no so if you don't mind me asking with all these jobs and functions and such, funding, funding how is uh, MIND funded? Um, I can only talk about how Burton and District MIND is funded. Because we're all separate organisations, it wouldn't be right for me to, to comment on others. Um, much of our funding, uh, we, we, we call this in the industry core funding. Um, it would be the, the funding from the NHS or from local authorities in some instances. Um, and national authority to some, uh, in some cases 
to, to provide some of your, your core services. So for us that would be our counselling services, but also our future focus and our distress services. And that probably makes up for about 80% of our funding. 10% of our funding then we're getting from um, grant applications, so short term projects. So the community will come and tell us, we would like to do something like music or walk and talk football to help us with our mental health. Well I would then be applying for grants um, in order to meet that need. Usually short term projects, so you know 12 weeks to 6 months, 8 months, that sort of thing. And we've usually got 4 or 5 of them going on at any particular time. The other 10% of our funding then comes from community fundraising. A lot of that is corporate funding, but we also accept donations from individuals and from fundraisers who might be engaged in cycling or walking. Um, we've even had someone do a parachute jump for us recently, so it's absolutely fantastic. Um, we have had a grant from National Mind to pay for a, um, uh, a fundraising um, coordinator. So um, our member of staff, Steph, is employed two days a week, not funded by our community fundraising, but funded by a grant from Mind, in order to make sure that we've got someone who can be there on hand to support anyone who would like to raise funds for us. Oh, thank you. Now, so uh, we're just wondering, because of course, Burton on Trent is a very diverse kind of society, and do you feel that there are some groups in society, either in Burton or perhaps widely, more widely, who face extra barriers when it comes to accessing mental health care? Ah, oh, absolutely. Um, okay, now let, let, let's be open and honest here. I am white, I am male, I am middle-aged. Okay? Ah, uh, my, my di uh, uh, Demographics? Thank you. My demographic wrote the rules. Let's be honest about this. We wrote the rules for us. We thought we wrote them for other people, but no, there are many, many barriers. So, for instance, our local census tells us that 17% um, of the people living in the Burton-on-Trent uh, area are either Asian or Muslim. Possibly both. We do not see 17% of our counselling participants being Asian or Muslim. It's probably closer to 7%. So clearly something isn't right. Now perhaps we can say, well that community is self-sustained and perhaps their mental health levels are lower than general population. I don't know if that's right. We need to do more here at Burton and District Mind around our entire community and not just about the Asian or Muslim population but for for people who are black uh, for people who have come here um, uh, uh, come here from European countries uh, for people who are refugees perhaps people who have been through the criminal justice system it's not enough that we just have our door open what we need to do is explore better and more effective ways of outreaching into the communities. Now, that's a challenge for us and we're meeting that through um, an equality plan um, that's led by, um, uh, led by Zanera, our equalities officer. Um, and also we've, we've been lucky to uh, win a contract with the Alzheimer's Society as well in trying to address some of this need that we have for over 65s across Southern Staffordshire. And that's a, a, a contract that will be launching very soon. Oh. So, <clears throat> well, thank you for talking about the participants. So, if you don't mind me going on to the other side of that, about um, when it comes to people who are providing the mental health care, are there any um, types of, say, demographics, genders, sexualities, ethnicities, and so on, that you would like to see more of in providing mental health care? Um. I think we've got a, a very diverse team here at Burton and District Mind. Um, it's certainly not a case of we would favour people because they belong to certain demographics. Everyone is employed here on merit. Um, and I think we have got a good team. Um, you know, we, we've got people who, who would identify as Asian. We've, we've got people who would uh, identify as, um, as homosexual. Um, 
I'm not sure where there are any gaps are. I think, I think for me, um, having lived experience of mental illness, that perhaps to the point where that's disabled you in your past, I think for, for us, that, that's, it, 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 it's not a barrier for us. Um, I'm not saying you can't have that empathy if you haven't had that lived experience, not at all. But there is some added value in the fact that we, we can support people here to turn some of what was a dark or, or, or distressing part of their life and turn that into a positive here. Um, and with lots of wonderful examples, myself included, of, of where we've done that. Oh, thanks, sir. And just quickly, if you don't mind me asking, because there's often a thing about men not shouldn't how it's seen as emasculating to seek to seek help for mental health. What would you say to someone who feels like I, you know, I want to seek mental health, but I'm worried about what the other guys will think of me and whether I'm like going to be seen as less manly or less able to cope and stuff. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I've, I've been working in mental health services now for about 15 years now. Um, and typically when we, when we go out to a, a mental health group, although they don't exist in the same way now, um, we typically see a third of those groups being men and two thirds of those groups being, uh, being women. When you go into inpatient services, it flips the other way. It's two thirds men and one third women um you know and i think that raises a question mark really in terms of perhaps men aren't approaching mental health mental illness as quickly as they could be or should be um I, and there's lots of reasons for that i'm not entirely sure the um I think what we consider to be masculine, I think that's changed over the last five years, certainly since the pandemic. So I think perhaps that's been moving in the right direction. Um, there's a wonderful story from uh, our Mental Health Ambassador Forum, and that's a group of people representing themselves or representing other organisations or uh, representing other people with mental health problems. We come together once every two months and discuss a, a topic um, and the topic at the time being discussed was the pandemic. We'd, we'd just come out of lockdown. And um, this, this gentleman who was uh, in his late 20s, he was talking about how him and his friends, male friends, had gone up and did some basketball. Got, got together for the first time since, the, since lockdown and played some basketball. And after they you know, participated in that exercise, they then sat down and just started having a chat. And the chat turned into a discussion about feelings and emotions. And that was quite an open conversation. Uh, and, you know, they exposed some vulnerability. And all was great until someone pointed that out and said, and I probably won't quote it correctly, but something along the lines of, uh, wow, look at us talking about feelings. And for a moment, the magic went as everyone recognised their vulnerability. But then somebody else went, well, it's... That's okay, isn't it? And perhaps we should do it more often. And then there was an agreement around, around that, that circle of friends to, to actually start being a little bit more open about their thoughts, feelings and behaviours. Um, and that can only be positive. What we learned from that is exercise is the catalyst. So that's why walk and talk football, that's why we started delivering that. The community were asking of us and we could see based on the anecdotal evidence um, how that would work and we had, um, we, we had I think it was 27 people take us up on our offer for walk and talk football and these are people that would have probably have never seen in any other way with you know mindfulness or ecotherapy perhaps that didn't connect with them but the, the walk and talk football did we're following that up with an application um, in order to do bat and chat cricket um, and to, to really kind of um, yeah, learn from all the positives that came out of that walk and talk football. Um, I hope that's helpful. But yeah, definitely. Men, please come talk to us. We are listening. Together we're going to find your help. Oh, thank you. And uh, so, if you don't, so I was just saying, um, what would you say is the uh, main strategy for tackling the mental health crisis? For ourselves or... As a community, what, how would you like to answer that? Well, from say we'll start with the um, Burton Mine. Okay, 
So, for Burton and District Mines, um, th there's a couple of things that we've done internally in terms of trying to think about some of the, the, the challenges that we're faced with. Um, first of all, we have to acknowledge that there is a sliding scale, a spectrum of mental, of, of good mental health and then poor mental health. Um, and that spectrum slides through uh, excelling, thriving, surviving, struggling, distress and crisis. There may be more, but that's how we've split it up. Um, across that then, we're also exploring four spheres of determinants of mental illness. So considering biological approaches, considering psychological approaches, considering social approaches and considering spiritual approaches. Now spirituality doesn't necessarily need to mean faith or religion, but for some people it can. For other people, it is just about asking that wider question of who I am, what's my identity. So for some people, they get as much out of, say, football or having pets as a religious person would from, from going to a church, temple um, or a mosque. Um, so by looking at those four spheres and breaking that apart, gives us, it gives us a, a better way of having the conversation in terms of how we can help people. So certainly um, our Future Focus service, which deals with some of the most vulnerable people in our community, as I say, have been disabled by their mental illness in the past. Um, there's a lot of focus around, um, around social interventions, so perhaps supporting them to make sure that they are eating enough, to make sure that, um, that, their, house is, that their, their house is not at risk of being taken away from them for any reason. Um, but he also supports sort of like the more spiritual things. So getting people out of the house and getting them to do more with their community, with other local charities or other things that's happening right sometimes just down the road that they've not considered before. And so uh, if you don't, and so well, thanks for that. And we're just wondering, for us like in say more broadly, would you say that uh, there should be a focus more on sort of like um, person centric on a person centric approach to mental health or is it more like a broad social issues based problem we're only ever going to tackle anything genuinely by by being as person centered as possible that that comes with the challenges uh, particularly when you, you know you're, you're having to to demonstrate um, facts and figures and and hit targets and and the rest of it so we're constantly you know trying to find where that middle ground is making sure that we remain person-centered and what we mean by that is genuinely and authentically asking that person what they want from our service and then working out the ways that we deliver that because uh, for some people medication is the key but we don't provide medication here we leave that for the experts in the NHS for some people it might be, um, so I'll give you a good example of, of Gemma on our Future Focus contract. Um, I asked her, you know, bumped into her in, in, in the kitchen, said, what are you up to today? She says, oh, I'm learning how to knit. And I was like, okay, how does that fit into anything? And she was like, because my participant wants to go and join a knit and natter group. That's her aspiration. But she doesn't know how to knit and is worried about looking silly because she doesn't know how to knit. So if I can teach her the basics, it will give her the confidence to attend that group. That's genuinely person-centred. Oh, thank you. So, uh, what role do you see Mind playing in the future development of Burton-on-Trent? That's a good question. Um, at the end of the day, you know, one in four people are going to have a mental health problem at some point in their lives. That's that. That's a stats that was you know often said before the pandemic, before the cost of living crisis. Whether it needs reviewing or not, I don't know. Uh, Burton on well, East Staffordshire Borough, I think has around a hundred thousand people living in it. That's a lot of people. One in four, two hundred and fifty thousand people knocking on our door at some point in their lives. It's a lot of people. Um, we have made moves, we will continue to make moves to keep mental health on the agenda 
for as wide as we can. So making sure that our local authorities, um, so Staffordshire County Council, um, consulted with us on their new mental health strategy. Um, and we're working with their public health team, particularly around the work at Shobnall, um, in order to, to make sure that, that mental health stays on the agenda. I think it's more than just that though. Um, since the pandemic, it felt like the community did put a spotlight on mental health, perhaps seriously for the first time ever. Um, and we know that because we were approached uh, by Making Trails, for instance, to be, uh, to, to be the charity of benefit for their sculpture trail. Um, we've got to make sure that spotlight stays on us. I don't know how we, we do that without sacrificing then those other emerging needs that the, the community has. But yeah, mental illness isn't going to go away. Uh, I wish it would. Uh, but the reality is that, that those wider determinants of mental illness aren't, aren't going away any, any time soon. So we need to embed some of this stuff into everyday practice. Uh, and we can do this through uh, the, the, the foresight um, five a day, for instance. Uh, we could do it by promoting exercise and about healthy thinking, um, about promoting people to talk more, um, you know, and, and, and to, to be where it counts really. So to make sure we're there where the community is. And we do that through our listening spaces and through attending uh, community events. Oh. And um, <clears throat> do you feel that uh, these could be replicated in other communities? or And how would you recommend, if you would recommend, because after all sometimes things are unique to certain areas, but what... How would, you rec how would you say other communities should be um, moving forward with addressing mental health? Um, I th you, you're right in saying that um, e every town, every locality is, is unique to itself. Um, so I think really uh, all you can do is apply almost like frameworks of development rather than trying to apply the same solutions. Um, so for instance we know you know, Tamworth, for instance, is, is a very different town to, say, Burntwood. Um, and not the same, not the things that would work in Tamworth wouldn't work in Burntwood necessarily, and vice versa. All we can do is say, you have to talk to your communities. And that's still not going to find solutions that are going to be suitable for everyone. But you, you're trying to find the sweet spot, spot on the bell curve, really, in terms of trying to maximise that reach, but keep it person-centred. Um, and yeah, we've still got a lot of work to do. We've still got a lot of work to do. Um, but yeah, we're here. We're listening. Please talk to us. I'll uh, thank you for talking to me and uh, I hope you have a nice day going forward. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It's welcome. lovely to see the ducks. Thanks. And uh, thank you, Kerry. Thank you for appearing on the programme. And thank you for being so supportive and kind in the production and giving the audience a good insight into how mental health charity works. Works at least here in, at least in Burton and this district. Well, uh, thank you everybody and whatever your mental health needs, whether you're feeling okay, whether you're in crisis, whether you're thriving, somewhere in between, it was lovely having you here.